Nicholas Bornovis of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you to our new podcast in the series Riding the Waves of a Lifetime. This podcast series enables us to interact, to discuss with the leading uh, personalities uh, in the maritime industry who share with us uh, life and career experiences as well as their insight into the industry's direction, opportunities, uh, challenges, and uh, risks. And uh, we are delighted to have with us today Mark O'Neill, who is the president uh, and CEO of Columbia Ship Management and also the uh, president of Intermanager. And I would like to welcome Mark, who is in Cyprus right now. I'm in New York and modern technology enables us to uh, connect. I, I'm sure everybody knows Mark. I will not go down his long CV, but I will highlight a couple of major uh, uh, elements. Since January 2017, Mark uh, has been the president of Columbia Ship Management, and now he is the uh, president of Intermanager also. Columbia Ship Management uh, is one of the top ship management and maritime service providers with a global footprint. And I would like to say, Mark, thank you very much for the great relationship we have developed together over the years and for your support. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you. That's, uh, and that's a pleasure, Nicholas, and, and the feelings entirely mutual. Thank you. So Columbia, uh, the group operates uh, in more, uh, operates more than 20 management and representative offices, crew agencies and training centers worldwide and manages a fleet of more than 400 vessels across different uh, market segments. Intermanager, on the other hand, is the only organization dedicated to representing the ship management industry. Uh, its members are in-house or third-party ship and crew managers and related maritime companies involved in managing more than 5,000 uh, ships and responsible for over 250,000 seafarers. And Mark was elected uh, president in November of 2020 with a tenure of two years. Now, Mark is a maritime lawyer by profession. We, we share the legal background since I got a law degree as well. Uh, he has been a partner with the international law firm of Stevenson Harwood and then with Rick Smith for 17 years. And at Rick Smith, Mark headed up the German shipping team uh, and also co-led the firm's offshore department. Obviously, during his long career, Mark has dealt with a full range of maritime industry stakeholders, and of course, he has continued to do so as the CEO of Colombia and, of course, as president of uh, Intermanager. So, Mark, again, welcome to today's podcast. I would like to start by asking you, how did you get into shipping? I, I know that as a maritime lawyer, you dealt with an extensive range of, range of industry stakeholders, but how and when did you actually cross over to the industry itself? Thank you, Nicholas, and, and, and thank you very much for your kind words. I, I think, like so many things in life, uh, it was by accident. And uh, when I look back at uh, my career so far, and it is far from over, uh, although these sort of interviews feel as though you're at, the, you're at somewhat of the end, um, I was always destined to be a career soldier. And uh, right from an early age, my father had been uh, in the army, an, an officer in the army. I was expected to uh, be an officer in the army. And I took a law degree simply because I couldn't think of anything else to take. I, I then did my uh, time in the army and came out of the army uh, in 1991 after the Gulf War and then really thought long and hard about what I should do. And it was because I couldn't think of anything else that I decided to uh, embark upon a, a legal career. The only law firm that would have me because I left this decision um, extremely late was a law firm called Constant and Constant, which back then uh, in the early 90s was um, a, a, a very small niche but top quality law firm specializing in maritime law primarily for uh, the Greek market and I remember turning up uh, on my first day not knowing a thing about shipping and being met by a partner Tanya Rickard and I have to say that all ships then looked extremely ugly to me and she said she pointed to one of these models as you, you may see behind me now uh, and said, you know, in a very short space of time, you will learn to love ships, you will learn to love 
uh, these models and how, uh, how true she was. So that was the start of my uh, legal career and after about 20 years of uh, extremely hard work and anyone who underestimates uh, how hard it is being uh, a lawyer whether you're in the UK or any other jurisdiction um, should really really look uh, look look hard at that at this as a career it's very fulfilling but extremely hard work after 20 years I remember hitting my 50th birthday and I was on the island of Kefalonia and I'd been up since four o'clock uh, doing an advice, which was the uh, pretty normal, uh, despite being on holiday, uh, and I was shaving, and uh, it was my birthday, and I thought, right now, what am I going to do with the kids? And I thought, I've had enough of this job, and I, uh, I knew that uh, certain clients of mine, Columbia and Marlow, were potentially going into a merge, and we'll perhaps talk about that later on. I remember calling up uh, Heinrich Scholler. Uh, the owner and chairman of Columbia and saying, I think you, you know, you need a, a CEO for this. Um, I'd like to put myself forward. And within 20 minutes, I got a call back uh, saying, absolutely. I've spoken to Herman Eden and we agree uh, that you should uh, move forward on that basis. So uh, fate got me into it and fate got me to where I am now. And, uh, and you know, it was ever thus, these things just seem to happen. Fascinating story, and uh, obviously, I think uh, your involvement right now is completely different. Uh, you know, as a practicing ship manager and ship owner compared to to the past, um, to your career as a maritime lawyer. But if you look back at your career, uh, are there a, a few milestones that you consider as very important in your overall development? Yeah, I think um, the first milestone was when I was three years old and I was playing out in the street and uh, there was a, 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 a guy called Fippi. And I remember we were in a place called Liebenau in Germany because my father was in the army and we were posted there. And this guy was a terrible bully and he used to bully me mercilessly. And I, I, I went, used to go running back to my mother crying and she said to me, right, uh, Mark, I want you to go out there and I want you to run, you lift your fists up and run at him shouting, I'm going to hit you. And this is exactly what I did. And Fippy took one look at me, turned tail and legged it down, down the road. And I have to say, probably that set the, um, the approach for the rest of my life. Firstly, a, a, a hatred of bullies. Uh, and secondly, that, you know, you, sometimes you just got to go at these things in, in, in a strong way. I think the next milestone was probably military academy at Sandhurst, where I was probably an unnatural soldier in the sense that discipline didn't come easy to me and I probably questioned too much, but I got through it and thoroughly enjoyed my time uh, as an officer leaving as a captain. Then I think uh, the Gulf War uh, in late 1990, early 1991, I think inevitably those sort of experiences do shape you and uh, at the very least are milestones and we'll talk about that uh, uh, later. Then constant and constant, finding my feet, uh, finding a terrific firm, uh, a terrific team. And I think teamwork is something that has always been important for me, uh, both in the army and subsequent. And I probably, although I always surrounded myself with great teams, I probably lacked teams t uh, in the wider sense in the law environment because it is very much dog eat dog you eat what you kill. And that's what I've so enjoyed about my time at Columbia is this sort of team spirit. I think then, of course, you the milestone is the 50th birthday that I told you about in the conversation with, uh, with Captain uh, Scholler. And I think there will be more milestones on the way. You know, I think we, we as individuals continually evolve. And I don't think for one moment, uh, this is the last uh, thing that I will do there will be other, hopefully, uh, many more milestones on the road ahead. Mark, thank you for sharing this with us. Frankly, we have the opportunity to discuss with other leading personalities like yourself in the industry. And I find it always fascinating when you hear to your personal stories, how each person's experience and background have contributed and prepared you for the people you are today and for the role you play today. So fascinating to hear exactly all this uh, discipline, all this, uh, um, all this experience, how they carry over to, uh, to your current role today. But 
you have changed uh, over the years. You had many heads of the maritime lawyer, now with Columbia, now as an industry head, much with Inter manager. So, would you like to share with us a couple of major challenges that you had, uh, and how did you address them and overcome them? I, I think, um, Nicholas, I think the word challenges is the correct one and uh, it's the correct terminology. I, I, I think challenges are just that, challenges. And, you know, I, I, I personally hate and, and uh, try and instill in those around me uh, not to use the word problems or, or, or crises. You know, we face uh, many challenges in our personal lives and in our business lives. And, and we, we have to deal with them and overcome them. And, and sometimes we deal with them and overcome them better uh, than, than other times. So I think there have been many challenges and there are many challenges. There will be many challenges. We will deal with them and we will overcome them. And sometimes we'll look back and say we did that particularly well and sometimes uh, uh, not so well. I think one of the biggest challenges, and I'll tell you a war story now, uh, one of the biggest challenges, and I think it, for me it was an epiphany because it, it set out how uh, what I felt towards people uh, was during the Gulf War when uh, we, we were in the last couple of days of the conflict and President Bush, if you, if you think back to the Gulf War, President Bush had given his ultimatum, you've got 48 hours to knock out as much of the, the Republican Guard as you can. So we, we were surging uh, within Iraq and uh, the problem was uh, the number of prisoners that were being taken. And the, the order went out that someone had to go forward to take a group of about 10,000 prisoners across a minefield of our own placing, I hasten to add, to get them out of the way of the tank battle that was then uh, raging. I, I didn't volunteer. We, we, there were three officers. I drew the short straw and I had to set off in my tank together with another tank. And we led these 10,000 people across this minefield, which we had laid earlier on through various means. And I remember um, all around us, these were anti-personnel mines, these anti-personnel mines were going off and people were getting badly injured. And uh, there was one guy who came to the front of my tank and he said, let me on the tank. And he'd had his foot blown off. And the question was then, do I take this guy on the front of the tank against all populations? He, he could have had a grenade on him. He could have shot us both or whatever. And we took, my, my driver and I decided to take this guy on the louvers of the tank. And I think, you know, sometimes you have these experiences where you take these decisions and you, you trust in humanity. And I had to then look this guy in the eye and say, am I going to trust you? Am I going to take you on this tank and save you? Or am I going to leave you behind? And I think that's probably, I did trust in him. I took him on the louvers. We got across the minefield uh, and, and he was duly delivered to the medics. But I think that shaped my life in always giving people the benefit of the doubt and, you know, if you place your trust in people, if you place your trust in humanity, you will be let down on occasions, but it is a much better place to be than distrusting people at every turn. So I think, you know, that type of challenge has probably shaped me more than the everyday challenges that we have to deal with and overcome, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Mark, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not trying to flatter you, but uh, this is a particularly touching and a particularly strong statement and you're so correct i think at the end of the day everything that happens is because of people and putting your faith and trust in humanity i think uh, is, is is the cornerstone of everything we do so thank you for uh, for verbalizing this and thank you for putting that at the forefront now going into uh, a little bit more into the business um aspect. You've been with Columbia Ship Management for five years. What have been some of the major changes and developments at the CSM during that time? And we will talk about Marlow later, but I know that since we joined the group, the group has been transformed to quite an extent. So share with us the development over these five years. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, yeah, it's easy to say this, isn't it? But I, I'm, a one, I'm in a wonderfully privileged place in working with a group, uh, uh, with the Columbia group and the team, the Columbia team. I mean, you know the team yourself, Nicholas. Uh, you know, it is uh, uh, Columbia's destiny and Columbia's path 
uh, was set by others than me and uh, all I have done is uh, is shepherded it in, in a very small way along the path that it was always going to follow. Uh, I think what we've seen uh, over the last five years is a, a real embracing of digitalization and technology in our performance optimization uh, control room which is really the future of shipping this this optimization of the whole process uh, but alongside that and i think accentuated by covid has been an equal if not more focus on people because you know you can invest in technology and digitalization as much as you like if you don't invest in the people emotionally and in training and economically uh, then it's all for for nothing and I think COVID has really taught us that. So through our I care philosophy, we really focus on our people. We focus on uh, our core values. We focus on quality. And, you know, we don't do anything here. And it sounds like uh, it sounds like sort of cheap marketing, but really, this, this is a, 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 a a core focus of our chairman that he started 41 years ago if you don't do something with the utmost quality just simply don't do it and 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 a quality service is right at the core so i think uh, uh, the whole path of columbia was set 41 years ago when it started uh, there's been some challenging times in there but we are really embracing uh, technology, embracing our people, em embracing the service ethos and mentality, because we're a service group and we should never forget that. Uh, and, and really, I think, uh, you know, one thing this company has always tried to do, and I think it's probably certainly from a personal point of view, been inspired by um, Captain Scholler, is that we always try to our very level best to be a better version of ourselves. And I think you know, if I if I was asked, what has that man done for me? And I mean that man, Captain Scholler, uh, uh, and for others here, it's always to try to be a better version of yourself. And, you know, get up every morning, look yourself in the mirror and give give 150 percent during that day. You'll make failures, you'll make mistakes. But that really uh, is at the, the, the fundamental approach of Columbia. So, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm a very lucky and privileged person to be here. Thank you, Mark. And I, and I would like also to second what you're saying. We have the privilege to work with all your team, besides Captain Solar, of course, Andreas Petru, Dimitris Chrysostomo, Nick Papados, and a lot of other people. And uh, uh, we are privileged and lucky to have gained such good friends, including yourself, of course, and, and, and cooperate, creating value in our own sphere. So mm. your trust in humanity and people, I think, is, uh, is mm. a cornerstone. So now let's move to Marlow. When uh, you announced that uh, you know the joint venture, the merger with Marlow, this was supposed to be a major step forward, ultimately it didn't happen. What does this mean for the future of the group? Mm. When I when I joined um, Columbia and and Marlow, I joined as the the, the joint CEO, and uh, there was huge expectation in the the benefits of the merger and you know you had and you have two uh, top quality organizations uh, two organizations at the very top of their game at that time both organizations were uh, performing strongly but were coming out of the uh, the, the tail end of the 2008 uh, crash and uh, shipping crisis. I think both organizations, um, they didn't fail in this merger. You know, I don't think either organization looks upon uh, the merger as a failure because what it did is emphasize to both organizations the strength of their own cultures and uh, the, the, the top performance of each of those organizations. They simply weren't compatible, but both organizations were and remain at the top of their game. And I have to say, honestly, when you look back over the last three or four years, I see the, the potential merger, because the merger 
didn't happen in practice, the potential merger was a positive. I mean, I again, come back, I, I hate the word failure uh, or, or looking at these things negative. I see it as a positive because it reminded both companies what they were, what they had to offer, the quality of their people, the quality of their service, which continue going forward. So, you know, we remain uh, on extremely good terms with our Marlowe colleagues. Uh, we remain uh, friends with a lot of our Marlowe colleagues. And, you know, I've certainly gained uh, a good number of friends through this whole process. And both organizations are in a much stronger position now, having gone through this uh, introspection, uh, if you like, uh, and, and come out of the other side and come out the other side stronger as organizations and stronger uh, in terms of people. So um, in a nutshell, that's where we are. I'm, I'm, I think we're both richer for the experience. I have to honestly say, although it, it's easy for me to say that, but you just have to trust me that it, it, it is actually the case. No, I do trust you. And I think, Mark, you, you put it in very honest and very realistic terms. I think it gave you the opportunity, each organization, to do some more introspection and maybe appreciate even more the uniqueness of uh, each organization's uh, competencies and advantages. And it's perfectly wonderful that you each continue on your way with uh, great success. So uh, I, I think um, you're right that at the end of the day, this has been a positive experience. Uh, so let's go now to company culture. I see that the motto is uh, I care. Uh, how important is company culture? And I know your, your, what your answer would be. How important is company culture in running uh, a successful company as yours? And obviously company culture stems from the company's legacy, but it's also a reflection also of the people at the top. So tell us about your efforts. Uh, to instill and maintain a great company culture. Yeah, I think, um, look, it kind of leads on from the last question. Uh, when, I, when I was in the army, culture, uh, teamwork uh, uh, was everything. And I kind of lost my way, I think, in my legal career because uh, the team becomes much more narrow. And I said, I referred earlier to sort of a dog eat dog, you eat what you kill, uh, et cetera. Culture in a law firm, uh, it may surprise you, it is not as strong as in, a, in an organization such as an army or in a, an organization such as a, a, a management company. Culture is hugely important. And I think, you know, if I have a personal failure, and I have many personal failings, if I have a, a, a personal failing over the last four or five years in going, if we talk about Columbia Marlowe, was that I, and perhaps we all, didn't appreciate just how strong the culture was in our respective organizations and how important that culture is going forward. And you can't just rule that out and say, right, we now have a joint culture, a new culture, because people are very protective of uh, a culture. Our corporate values respect, massive word respect, and, and, and easy to, uh, you know, glance over it huge and what does it mean and it's important for uh, all of our people to understand what respect is not just respect for one another but respect for our clients and respect for our um uh, you know service partners who are hugely important to us delivering a great service to our clients loyalty uh, competence accountability passion all of those were our five core values and and what we did uh, pretty early on after i started is decide how do we how do we focus people's minds on that? How do we get them to look back and really think about those core values and try to identify their own personal values with the company uh, core values? And that was through this I care. And it wasn't we care, it was I care because we didn't want people to hide behind the collective. We wanted them to think about uh, this themselves. So you can't turn on a computer here without affirming the core values and conf confirming you care. You can't start a meeting without discussing I care values and, and, and caring issues. And, you know, we really ingrained this in, uh, in our culture and all of our processes uh, are going forward. Now, companies evolve, companies, it's wrong for culture to be fixed. And therefore the culture, the challenge this year over the next six months is to have a campaign on diversity and have a campaign on sustainability and add those two 
to our core values. So we will have seven core values because diversity is massively important in, in of increasing importance going forward, uh, as is uh, sustainability. So I can't, uh, I can't emphasize enough how much I lost my way on the importance of culture and core values, and then how refreshing and relieving it was to go through a process, the merger, where we saw a collision of core values and collision of cultures, and the and out of that, the 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 uh, the experience, how important that is to both companies and their continued and future successes. So uh, uh, absolute crucial importance. Thank you, Mark. It goes back, I think, exactly to your comments about uh, putting your trust in humanity and, of course, working with all your clients, business partners and staff. Um, at the end of the day, business is resting on people. Um, so now let's go to, uh, to the industry section of our discussion. You're a man of vision. You're a man who is seeking results. And therefore, you're a man of strong opinions. And that's terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's start the discussion about the ship management industry today about 30 percent of the global fleet is managed by third-party managers and you have been quoted as uh, the opportunity that uh, exists there to reach out to the remaining 70 percent with a value proposition and also as you have stated the uh, ship management industry should focus on quality rather than just on uh, price reductions uh, and you should try to offer a quality at um, quality service at a fair price. So, take us through all this concept. Uh, mm. I, I, the way I came at this, when when I grew up, my father left the army. He set up a security company, man guarding company in the UK. And the man guarding company in the UK was very similar to the ship management sector. Uh, within shipping insofar as it was dominated by uh, a small number of the larger players who were destructively competitive against one another, driving prices down, uh, using ever larger economies of scale and scalability. And with that, as the prices get driven down, so the quality inevitably uh, falls away as well. And in that industry, there was no standard whatsoever. So anybody could set up a man guarding uh, a company. Uh, similarly to anybody can set up a, a, a ship management company uh, and manage pretty much every ship except tankers and, and, and offshore vessels, which require certain uh, 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 more regulations than bats, bulkers or, or, or container vessels. So we have a ship management industry in a very similar uh, uh, circumstance, servicing about 25% of the shipping community. Those companies don't have a standards, they fight against one another, they drive the prices down, the quality uh, varies uh, uh, across the, the, the whole spectrum from a, a sort of a cowboy image on uh, one end to uh, top quality uh, at, at the other achieved through scalability and, and economies of scale. So the industry is crying out, in my view, for a standard, a minimum standard to clean up uh, its image vis-a-vis -vis the wider uh, industry and attack that 75% of the sector, which remains to be convinced of what I think is a compelling proposition. Uh, ship management, if done properly, if done at a fair price, uh, if done at, 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 at the higher end of the quality uh, spectrum, is a compelling proposition for an asset owner that actually wants to trade that uh, asset competitively and profitably and leave the management, leave the crew management, leave all of those other issues, those problem issues to a competent ship management, to a manager. So I think we need, uh, we need a standard, we need an association with a voice, uh, and we need to attract all of the broad church that is ship management into this association uh, and change it for the better and make it compelling both to join that uh, association uh, and raise the standards but not be prescriptive so not compare you know the the big boys against the small boys there is a need in this industry for a broad church there is a need for the big players and there is a need for the smaller niche players uh, that may achieve scalability through other ways as opposed to just size and, and volume. 
Mark, we will get to the point of benchmarking because I think that is one of the major uh, things where you have uh, strong opinions. But before we go to that, I wanted to ask you the following. The shipping industry today, uh, with the involvement that I have, and I look at it, you have massive requirements for investment to comply with environmental regulations, with fleet renewal. I mean, shipping is a capital intensive industry. So if you are, and at the same time, shipping remains a highly fragmented industry. So besides the value proposition that is there, I wanted to ask you, are there competitive pressures on smaller owners? How can these owners or asset owners compete and address all of the challenges that they have today? Um, would the third party management uh, concept offer them exactly that solution? Mm. Uh, I, I think the short answer is they, they can't compete in the same game, but they don't need to. They need to find their own environment and their own niche and their own place. Uh, and they don't need to compete because there will always be a calling for a particular uh, type of manager. They may be more expensive, but that more expensive service may be what a particular client is, is looking for. So I don't think there is a need for them to compete. I think there is a compelling need in this industry to achieve scalability. And there is no doubt that you need scale scalability on uh, procurement, you need scalability on resources, you need scalability on technology and, and manpower, but you don't need to be big to achieve that scalability. You can do it in more intelligent ways by combining in various associations uh, with, with various service providers. But without that scalability, I think uh, uh, life is very, very difficult. I would not want to be uh, in an organization that is much, much bigger than we are at, at the moment. Uh, I think uh, the question of whether there is still room for consolidation uh, uh, amongst some of the bigger players, I question that. I don't think when you look at uh, some of the consolidation efforts, I don't think they've been successful. I don't think anyone would pretend uh, that they've been successful. I think you get to a certain optimum size. I think we still have uh, some way to go uh, before we before we hit that, but we will not want to go beyond that. I think you get to that optimum size and, and then you, you don't need to go uh, any further. But I think scalability is, is absolutely key. And I also uh, firmly believe that quality is not the preserve of the smaller operator. I, I, I really do not accept that smaller ship managers do it better because they give more attention. It's got nothing to do with size. It's about approach and attitude. And, you know, we as a company try to give the one ship owner exactly the same service as we give the top PLC uh, listed uh, listed shipping company with, with, with 50 vessels. And I think if you don't do that, then you, want to start, then you want to go into a different industry. You have to give quality of service to the smallest of your clients in just the same way as the biggest. So I don't think being small gives you more time or ability to deliver a quality service. You need that scalability somehow though. Mark, I'd like now to, to go to benchmarking because one of the main arguments that you have brought up and it's a very valid one, is the need to set industry standards to benchmark ship managers. How can this happen? And who could drive such an initiative? Mm. Look, um, uh, this comes back to my point again about the need for this industry to have a standard. And, I, and I've been quite vocal about that for the reasons and the, the analogies I've drawn with the security industry. I think there is uh, benchmarking is very dangerous because a manager that has a challenging fleet may have more observations or um, points of record on the vessels he or she manages than a manager who manages a new fleet. It's very difficult to compare performance uh, on different classes of vessels and on different ages of vessels and vessels operating in different uh, uh, ge geographical locations. So benchmarking, very difficult to do. So what we at Intermanager are trying to do is set general, general principles which are inclusive, 
of the big and the small. So it's not the, the big companies with all of the resources who are going to find it easier than the smaller companies. It's general propositions, general principles, which we should all aspire to sustainability, diversity, equal opportunities, et cetera, green recycling. It's these sort of issues that are fairly commonplace outside of the shipping sector, but that are now finding uh, their voice in, in, in the shipping sector. So uh, we, we believe that as a first step, to benchmarking in the loosest possible sense, setting these general principles, which are inclusive, which are a broad church, which are aspirational and which are not prescriptive, uh, is the way ahead. Thereafter, once we become comfortable with that, we will have a, um, if you like, a marking uh, system in the loosest possible sense of broad, bronze, silver and gold as to where companies are on their journey within these general principles and always recognizant of the fact that companies are trying their best to achieve these certain principles. And that's the most important, uh, that's the most important thing. And then a, an audit from an external auditor, uh, a company of, uh, which Intermanager will retain to assist companies in achieving those general principles and, and showing and guiding how they best do so and, and pointing out where they don't achieve uh, the desired objective. So I think that's that's where we want to go at first. I think to bring in KPIs, to bring in hard benchmarks right from the start will turn potential uh, association members away because it's not recognizant of this um, very divergent and diverse uh, business that we operate in. Very interesting. So Mark, now let's go to another uh, very important and critical topic, the crewing crisis. And I know this has been a major area of focus for you, both as Columbia and also under your intermanager uh, role. Mm -hmm. You have correctly stated that signing on to the Neptune Declaration and then forgetting about it is not enough because this should not be a PR exercise. So take us through what you see as a potential way of the industry addressing this crisis. There has been uh, obviously progress, but it has been maybe achieved in a slower pace than what everybody would desire and, and what is ultimately the way out of this yeah I, I you know i i i have to um control myself here actually because i do see that we are a very introspective uh sector uh the, the whole shipping community and uh you know i said recently if any of us go to a dinner party and we say when we're allowed to go to dinner parties again uh, and say uh you know i'm involved in shipping people look at you as though you've just landed from mars and people haven't the faintest idea about shipping and this is a much wider problem which goes to the whole issue of recruitment and and pr of the shipping sector uh, generally the only time people hear about shipping is when a, a container vessel gets stuck in the Suez Canal and they're worried about when their next Amazon package is going to land uh, at their front door you know we don't do enough as a sector to uh, publicize our, and voice issues within the sector which affect the wider population and you know I'm a I'm a firm believer that all decisions in life are taken by shareholders uh, whether they be shareholders of uh, publicly listed companies uh, or whether they be shareholders in voters within countries uh, we're all shareholders we all have a stake in something and the challenge for the shipping industry is to look outward and towards those shareholders and address those shareholders on issues which uh, affect us and not go uh, looking inwards through the IMO or other organizations which are simply not designed to be a loud speaker of those issues. They are regulators within a very bureaucratic uh, uh, system. The IMO is, uh, does it the best job it possibly can. I have the, the immense respect for the IMO, but it is not our voice piece. It is not a loud speaker for the shipping industry uh, issues. And it is self, it is itself constrained by other UN institutions, such as the World Health Organization in relation to uh, vaccinations and, and, and crew rotations, and all sorts of other political bureaucratic uh, influences. You know, we have to come together as a single voice 
and look outward, not inward. Take the BIMCO video. The BIMCO video, I'm sure some of us uh, listening to this have seen the BIMCO video. And what a fantastic video it is. It brings tears to all of our eyes in the shipping industry. Now, the first BIMCO video, I bet never saw the light of day outside most companies' boardrooms or perhaps their senior management levels. That should have been on every breakfast TV uh, uh, program around the world so people actually saw what it meant to be involved in shipping and the importance of shipping. You know, we need to come together. We have so many intertanko, intermanager, intercargo, BIMCO, ICS, you know, all voicing their opinions and I'm, uh, I'm the worst of them. Uh, what we need to do is come together and look outward and, and get a proper PR agency, uh, uh, international PR agency and spread the word outward and attack the shareholders. Then you will, then you will focus on your, your crewing problem. Then you will focus on uh, environmental concerns that are particular to the shipping industry, which are not being focused on uh, uh, at all. We're too inward looking. So um, in, that's the short answer. <laughs> no, no, that, Mark, I think uh, you, you hit the, uh, the nail right on, on the head. It, it's exactly that the shipping industry has traditionally been inward looking. And now it is absolutely important that it become outward looking. If we don't, Nicholas, if we don't, we will just become a small cog in the overall logistics chain. We, the reality is that shipping is no more important to logistics than haulage, to uh, uh, rail, to aviation. We have this uh, glorified, glamorous opinion of ourselves that, that everything revolves around shipping. Nobody cares about shipping. Nobody knows about shipping. And if we don't get our act together and speak as one strong voice, we will be swallowed up and we will just be boxers uh, uh, going across oceans with, with, with none of the special features and circumstances that we have uh, that are so, so precious to us all uh, in this industry. Let me move on to the next topic of uh, technology. And I know you've been a passionate advocate of uh, digitalization. Technology is changing rapidly day by day. COVID has accelerated the pace of change. Looking ahead, what do you expect uh, to see as major advancements uh, or impact uh, transforming the industry further because of technology? Look, I think, uh, you know, I touched on it earlier. I think before COVID, all the talk was about digitalization, uh, you know, technology, uh, optimization. And, and I think one thing that COVID has taught us is uh, reinforce the importance of people. All of these technological advancements, all of the, the this digitalized age, they are simply tools to enhance human performance. Without uh, well-trained, well-motivated, well-paid, uh, equal opportunity people on the other end, all of this is counts for nothing, frankly. And, you know, I was perhaps um, the, the, the biggest fan of digitalization before COVID. Now I see it very much. I'm very grateful to digitalization. I'm very grateful to our performance optimization control room, to our learning management system, because we were able to get through this crisis and come out stronger uh, because of it, not have our service uh, impacted or adversely impacted. Without that technology, I would have hated to have gone through uh, this crisis, but it is simply a tool. And I think when the dust settles and when we fully emerge out of this, we will see this whole digitalization process as no more than um, uh, the uh, the advent of the email or the uh, you know or the word processor was uh, twenty or thirty years uh, twenty or thirty years ago. You know this is an evolution; it's not a revolution. Uh, and the most important component part of this evolution is and will always be people. Indeed. Now, you are the president of Intermanager, therefore you have a broader uh, industry role and footprint. How do you see Intermanager contributing to all the various challenges and issues the industry is facing today? You already touched upon that, but maybe you can amplify a bit more. I think, um, you know, we see as managers, and at this point was brought home when, uh, 
uh, the uh, IMO Secretary General Kai Tat Lim visited our offices here, seems a lifetime ago now, but it was the last Maritime Cyprus, so it was two years ago, and he said, look, he sat around our boardroom table, and this was way before my involvement in, in inter-manager, and he said, look, you know, ship managers have got to engage more. You know, we, the IMO, we're always being criticised, but we're not the loudspeaker, we're not the lobbyist for the shipping industry. Ship managers need to get involved more because no one sees a wider variety of vessel types, uh, technical issues, uh, problems, sanctions, etc. All of these geopolitical issues than the ship man than the large ship managers. Nobody, there is no operator out there with a more diverse fleet than Columbia managers now. So we're uniquely placed, uh, perhaps almost responsible to get out and voice our opinions on certain issues and, and, and be heard. So I think Intermanager, uh, not only uh, uh, does it have that exposure to these issues, it's also the employer of 90 to 95 percent of the world's 1.7 million crew. So, you know, we are effectively, perhaps not legally, but effectively the crew manager employer for all of those crew. We have a responsibility. We shouldn't just sit back. And yet, we're not part of the round table, uh, the round table of Intertanko, BIMCO, ICS, uh, uh, Intercargo. We're not part of that. We should be part of that. We should demand to be uh, at that table because nobody has the diversity of this view. That said, we can also be a little bit of a maverick. So whereas those organizations have been sucked into this uh, and play an important part, um, perhaps more diplomatic, bureaucratic route of the IMO, WHO, etc. We can assist them and support them, but at the same time be the maverick on the outside and, and shake the trees and rattle the cages when it suits our purposes without disturbing the delicate diplomacy that is often and sometimes needed. So I think Intermanager does need to step up. It is stepping up and it will step up. And, uh, you know, part of that is attracting some of the bigger, some more of the bigger players into the association so that we have a really strong voice and a strong representation, a strong mandate. Very interesting, Mark. And obviously, you know, the, the industry needs the leadership and involvement of all these organizations to move forward, given the complexity of the issues that the industry is facing today. Now, let's move to the... Uh, last uh, part of our uh, of our discussion you are the ceo of a major global company clearly pre-covid you've been on the go 24 7 uh, and hopefully we will be able to start again uh, traveling soon uh, so how how especially i think in ship management you are on the go all the time how do you balance uh travel personal life I think um, you know each person has to decide for themselves what their what their drivers are and what their priorities are. And um, you know I, I, I'm a firm believer in not trying to be something you're not. Uh, I think being a motivated, driven person was always important for me and is always important for me. And if you ask my kids, I'm sure they'll tell you that I don't balance. Um, but, you know, if someone asks me about my work, I will say to them, I haven't worked in the last five years. It doesn't feel to me like work because my work, uh, personal life blends into one. And this is my greatest hobby, my greatest love, my greatest passion. I have incredible amount of fun. Uh, I, I never think of it as work. I think of it as effort. A and that would be my advice to anyone. Um, whereas I was a perhaps a, a hamster on a on a hamster wheel for 20 something years of my life while I was a lawyer and didn't really enjoy it at all actually when I make a comparison with my life now now I'm not working I'm, I'm doing what I was made to do and enjoy doing and that would be my advice to to everyone who has the opportunity find that um, nirvana uh, where, where you feel that, that this is not work. It's still hard effort, but it's not work. Work suggests some sort of compulsion, some, uh, some being forced. Uh, now, in that scenario, balance 
is probably not doesn't fit in and you probably you probably share that nicholas i i, I think uh, what is balance i think if you're always looking to find that balance you're in the wrong job it, it, it should never really arise as an issue um your, your personal and business life should be harmonious and and uh, you shouldn't resent the one for the other uh, and, and vice versa it, it should be just a natural seamless uh, uh transition you're absolutely right, Mark. I mean, I can completely share into this. Obviously, when you love what you do, then, you know, there's not, there are no barriers. And uh, you're so absolutely right. And uh, I'm with I, you. I always say to people, I always say to people here, when they start, when I have my first meeting with um, uh, uh, the, the newbies, I, I, I'm always, when we go around the table and I ask what, departments they're in i make the point that uh, you know not only are we extremely privileged to have them but they're very privileged to be here and if they don't like what they do don't leave ask to move into another department that they want to do because we're interested in them as people so you know some of our best people in marketing came from accounts some of our best people in accounts came from technical you know you you find your way never sit at your desk feeling peed off and, 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 you know, I can't wait to go home and looking at your watch. You're in the wrong job and life is too short to be in the wrong job. Ask me, I spent 20 years in the wrong job, you know, and, and find the right job, but be in an environment which facilitates that too. And, uh, you know, uh, life is too short. So you've got to find that, that, that uh, job that doesn't feel like work. Well, now that we opened this uh, subject, uh, how do you like uh, living and working uh, out of Cyprus? I know that you are, you know, spending a lot of time in, in other places as well, but Cyprus, I think, is your base now. So how do you enjoy? Well, I, I don't know whether you can see the sun shining. It's, it's I do, I do, and I'm very excited. I'm wearing a t-shirt <laughs> simply because I, 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 I'm not sure I would survive wearing a, a shirt. So excuses for any sartorial uh, uh, mistakes there. But... Uh, you know, Cyprus is a very special place and it's a very special place in, in my heart, um, always has been. Uh, I first came to Cyprus when I was in the army and I had to do a UN tour here uh, and uh, for six months and uh, was amazed that I could, uh, I was in the skiing team in those days, the cross country skiing team and we, we did a race in the Trudos Mountains in the morning and then lay on the beach in the afternoon. And there's not many places in the world that you can do that. But most importantly, I think, you know, Cyprus, apart from the weather, uh, is the people. And, and they really are the most amazing people. You, from the moment you step off the plane, you are just in this, the warmth comes from the people as well as uh, from the sunshine. You know, you're in an amazing can-do environment, uh, an amazingly intelligent population where everybody seems to have at least one degree uh, and uh, a, a very upbeat, happy population. So, you know, I love it. By the same token, I spend half my time in Hamburg, also a lovely city and, and, and lovely people. So when I'm in Cyprus, uh, I, I look forward to going to Hamburg. When I'm in Hamburg, I look forward to, to Cyprus. So again, you know, as I said, very privileged and uh, 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 very lucky. Well, I have to say, I can't wait until the moment that we are hosting again our Limassol event. Uh, yes. uh, we love coming to Cyprus when we have gained so many friends there. and It's a terrific place. So coming to uh, the closing of our discussion, what is next on your agenda for yourself and Colombia? Look, I think um, Colombia's path uh, is, is to some extent uh, set. Uh, it will continue to develop. It will continue to be uh, completely focused on being client facing and on quality and on service. We will get into and, and forge partnerships with, uh, with other service uh, providers. What, what I didn't want at the start of COVID was that this company would be defined by COVID and you know we went out right at the start myself and the senior management team to all of the employees and said look we have a an agenda and we're going to by golly deliver that agenda uh, come hell or high water and not be defined by this and we have we've had an incredibly um, progressive two years and uh, you know I don't look back at, uh, upon this as a negative time at all by the same token we're not through it yet we're not nearly through it yet and life albeit that we you know we won't have to wear these things for very much longer uh, life it is going to be different and uh, 
you know, there is, for me, the next challenge is corporate anxiety. You know, so these, this anxiety, a fluffy concept to still wrongly, I hasten to add to a lot of us, but we shouldn't underestimate when people come back to work and we're pretty much all back to work here in Cyprus, uh, but, but in our other offices, there is going to be this anxiety. So I'm focusing on that very much. How do we get around that? And what is the balance? Uh, uh, you know, what changes do we have to make to the business working from home, uh, using technology more efficiently, uh, travel, what, what is our travel? these are fundamental to uh, the development of uh, our business. So very much looking forward to, uh, together with a fantastic team, I have to say, uh, continuing to shepherd the business through this, but not be defined by it. You know, uh, I think the moment we, the moment we think this thing has in any way adversely affected us is the moment we, we are uh, to some extent defeated by it. And, and that's, that's not going to happen. Thank you, Mark, for those uh, great remarks. Now, coming to the closing of our discussion, let me ask you, after having built uh, such a successful career and reflecting back, what advice would you give to your younger self? Uh, would you have done anything differently or what advice would you give to anybody else who wants to come into the industry? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a Cancerian, so um, I, I'm always too sensitive. And, and probably if I look back in my life, uh, I would be less sensitive and, and rather more thick skinned. Um, and I think as well, uh, I'm now in a place in my mid 50s where I uh, very much uh, accept and appreciate the importance of um, understanding, of accepting uh, and uh, and the diversity of people you know i think uh, being able to understand people and their their needs and their anxieties and their worries and uh, understanding them and the wonderful strength that diversity and all sorts of diversity gives to an organization that unfortunately comes with age and, and it hits you. And, and this is what I'm trying now, rather than just introduce diversity and sustainability as corporate values as a snapshot, uh, we're, we're embarking on a six month program to educate people uh, of all ages why issues such as diversity and sustainability are important so that hopefully people get it rather sooner than myself that was, I have to say, rather blinkered and rather sheltered uh, up until um, you know, perhaps the last the last ten years, and those those sort of that understanding acceptance comes with age. So, uh, I, I think uh, if I was to go back, I, I would be a lot more generous to uh, dif differences, um, where perhaps I w I was less accepting than I am now. Mark, thank you very very much. We had uh, a tremendous discussion. I really appreciate all the insight that you shared with us. Um, 